Hello everyone, this is Stephen Zuckerman again in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, talking to you about, um, um, oh yeah, Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, which is a disease which is becoming ever more prevalent as people survive longer and live to older ages, of course. Uh, it causes a significant decline in cognition and functional abilities and its cost to society monetarily as well as emotionally is incalculable. Alzheimer's disease by definition comes on over a fairly prolonged amount of time. And this slide depicts the natural sort of progression or spectrum of normal cognition to what's called minimal cognitive impairment, which can have some memory deficits, but people's ability to function in their everyday lives is not impaired in MCI. And then eventually um, the impairment becomes worse and they would be considered to have Alzheimer's disease at that stage. Alzheimer's disease is certainly the most common form of or cause of dementia, uh, accounting for at least 30 to 40 percent of all cases. And as you can see from this slide, there are several other diagnostic considerations. 10 percent may have multi-infarct state or a vascular type dementia. Many people can have the combination of both Alzheimer's pathology along with that of subcortical white matter disease or vascular dementia. And in the uh, category of non-Alzheimer's dementia, you would find uh, dementia with Lewy bodies and other rare or rarer types or more rare types, which would be either frontal lobe dementia, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or even a progressive supranuclear palsy. This slide depicts the risk factors for development of Alzheimer's disease and far and away the largest single recognizable factor of that of age and in fact for every five years after the age of 65 the incidence doubles um, so as one gets to 85 there is a very high chance of a development of Alzheimer's symptoms Family history and genetic disorders are known risk factors. And if there is a first degree relative who has Alzheimer's, your risk is twice that of the non-affected. There is the um, apolipoprotein epsilon allele four, and there are three alleles, two, three, and four. And uh, if you have the allele two, you have a lower risk of the development of Alzheimer's Whereas if you have a heterozygote risk, a heterozygote APO epsilon 4, your risk is probably two to five times that of normal. Whereas if you are homozygote APO epsilon 4, then your risk is probably five to 10 times that of the non-affected population such that 85% uh, of people will develop Alzheimer's by the time they're 85 with homozygote apo epsilon 4. There are some possible risk factors not, not yet established or proven, and they're listed here. But there is one saving grace, and that is there is evidence that if you are bilingual, and um, by that is meant you speak very well and fluently, and concurrently two different languages, then that can have the effect of forestalling the effect of Alzheimer's pathology on the symptoms of uh, cognitive impairment. And so you uh, may have a delay of about four years before your Alzheimer's become apparent compared to those who are only monolingual. The neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease involves the formation of extracellular amyloid plaques, which are usually present near synapses. 
and these consist of the deposition of insoluble beta amyloid proteins as well as neurofibrillary tangles which are made up of hyperphosphorylated tau proteins. These uh, two pathological changes lead to the death and loss of neuronal cells as well as to synaptic uh, loss. Depicted here is the pathology in which there is the deposition of the hyperphosphorylated tau proteins that are seen in the microtubules of the axons as well as the neuritic plaques and uh, macroscopically this leads to the changes that are visible at, in neuroimaging of loss of cortical volume, increase in ventricular volume, and in particular loss of hippocampal volume. This slide summarizes the amyloidogenic theory of pathogenesis of Alzheimer's beginning with APP which stands for amyloid protein precursor which can get broken down by one of three secretases. If the alpha one is the active one then those uh, proteins do not become insoluble and they are not pathogenetic whereas the beta and the gamma secretases can break the APP down to A beta 40 or in particular A beta 42 which uh, does undergo aggregation and the formation of amyloid plaques. In addition, uh, the tau protein, if it gets hyperphosphorylated, causing the paired helical filaments, ending up as neurofibrillary tangles, and those two probably add to oxidative stress, inflammation, mitochondrial damage, etc., etc., etc. By and large, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is made on a clinical basis and it is, in fact, a diagnosis of exclusion after other treatable or reversible entities are excluded. Uh, there do exist some biomarkers for the presence of Alzheimer's, and most recently, there has been the development of a scan using. Uh, would however you pronounce fluorobetapir um, to look for amyloid deposition called an amavid scan which is fairly sensitive um, otherwise people used to look in the spinal fluid for the presence of markers with a high titer of phosphorylated protein and a low a beta 42 and that ratio would be fairly sensitive to Alzheimer's disease as well. Here is an Amavid scan showing an Alzheimer's patient on the right and how well the amyloid proteins are visualized by the use of this technique. Current therapies to treat Alzheimer's disease have at best a modest effect but they are certainly recommended and supported by the medical literature including the Cochrane Library that patients with Alzheimer's should be treated with these medications. Most Alzheimer's trials use one of a very few scales to determine whether the medication has had any impact on cognition. The ADAS-COG or the Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Scale Cognitive is probably the most commonly used tool to determine any change in cognitive abilities. Another scale would be the clinician's interview based impression of change which just by its name seems to be fairly subjective. The significant question regarding the application of these scales for these trials is whether or not a statistically, di statistically significant difference and performance on these scales can actually translate into a clinically significant change such that the patient notices a difference in their life and that really is uh, the big question mark in this field. There are three medications that have been approved by the FDA for the treatment of mild 
to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And these all fall in the family of choline esterase inhibitors and include the three medications here listed, donepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. And they work by increasing the function of acetylcholine in the synapse by reducing its rate of breakdown by that choline esterase enzyme. The effects are at best very modest. Nobody really gets a dramatic improvement in their overall memory. Perhaps the rate of decline of their loss of cognition is slowed, but uh, they're worth a try. The only other medication which has received FDA approval for treating Alzheimer's disease is the NMDA antagonist memantine or Nemenda, which is indicated for the treatment of more severe Alzheimer's disease and it acts by blocking the effects of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. And here is a slide for those visual learners depicting synaptic clefts and the NMDA antagonist on the left and the choline esterase inhibitors on the right, which I'm sure will clarify and solidify this knowledge forever and ever. So that is the rather unfortunate state of our clinical armamentarium for treatment of Alzheimer's patients, though this is an area of tremendously active research, but unfortunately, as of yet, there have not yet been found to be any much more successful solutions. Uh, here is a listing of various trials and attempts to um, prevent the formation of amyloid in its deposition, but unfortunately, none have been shown to be very successful to date. They have also attempted to reduce the formation of the A-beta-42 proteins by controlling which secretase is effective on the amyloid precursor protein. No go. Medical type interventions have included estrogen replacement in postmenopausal women, which did not show any benefit, or cholesterol lowering medications, which again were not effective. Medical therapies have also included nicotinic agonists, as well as glucose lowering medications, and with the exception of one intranasal insulin studies, they were also disappointing. It's been postulated that one of the reasons that all of these trials have not been successful is that we're attempting to intervene at a stage of the disease process where there's already been irreversible damage and changes to the neurons. This is a disease process that has probably taken place over multiple decades and yet we simply do not have enough disease markers to be able to recognize these changes until there are clinical findings, in which case it's probably already too late to intervene effectively. With this concept in mind, here is a list of three ongoing trials, which is attempting to avoid that problem by intervening or treating patients as early as possible, either on the basis of a family history or um, an Amovid scan even before there are um, clinical symptoms. And here is a very uh, nicely depicted summary slide showing on the right hand side clinical trials and on the left where in the amyloid cascade there is an attempt to intervene. I'm not going to go into any detail but you are certainly welcome to stop the progression of this video and uh, review this slide for whatever reason.